The 82nd Airborne Unit, the 101st Airborne Unit, and the British Red Devils all jumped in Normandy on D-Day. We fought in there for 36 days and came out. And of course, they had to replace nearly all the men. We lost 70%. I jumped in with 20 men at midnight, and by 3 o'clock in the morning, I was down to two men. But we accomplished what they had asked us to do. We came out of there, and they re-equipped us, and we jumped in Holland then on September the 17th. We accomplished our mission there in 36 hours. They had given us six days. We did it in 36 hours, and then they used us as shock troops from then on for 78 more days. One second, Jake. Take that right down to your throat like that, and everybody will hear every word you say. Okay. Hey, y'all. Uh, we caught in there for 78 days without a change of clothes or bath or resupply. We just stayed off the, off of the land, what you could find in the ground. And when I came out of there after fighting for 78 days behind the line, they gave me a 72-hour pass as my reward, and I didn't think that's quite enough, so I took 10 more days they walked. Uh, when I reported back in, they put me under arrest quarters so they could decide what they wanted to do. And they offered me the opposition, the opposition of volunteering for parachute pathfinding units. If they wanted to get you killed, they couldn't assign you to the pathfinder, but they could make it attractive for you to, to volunteer. And I volunteered for pathfinders and went into it, and, ba and Bastogne broke out a few days later. I thought the war really was over, that I'd never have to jump again as a pathfinder, but it broke out about 10 days after I went into pathfinding, and so I did jump in Bastogne on December 23rd. I took 20 men in there, and we brought in by parachute. The weather was so bad they had no visibility and we only had a three mile diameter. And I brought in enough supplies there to supply the whole division. I brought in 1,440 tons of equipment in three days. After coming out of that zone, uh, that was when I volunteered to go into pathfinding service, five more men in my outfit, and one officer volunteered to go with me. And so, when we got back out of there, I had only lost one man on the mission. And Colonel Sink found out about it, and he called the pathfinding headquarters, and he said, you send those six SOBs back to me. He said, evidently, I can kill them quicker than you can. And I said, we'll send five of them back, but we're going to keep McNeese. He said, he's essential to our operation. I stayed in there another 10 or 15 days, and then the 90th Division from Patton's 3rd Army got cut off and from Germany in the Siegfried Line. And I jumped in there making my fourth combat jump into from Germany on Friday, February the 15th, 13th. We all, I was, there was only two men out of the 50,000 of us that went in with the 101st that made four parachute drops and behind the enemy line. I was one of them, George Blaine was the other. So I wear four combat swords on my wings. When I came out of there, I returned back to my company and we pulled down through southern Germany and Austria. We liberated the first concentration camp that was liberated at Landsberg. That was Hitler's big hang out where he spent two years in prison and where he wrote his book, Mein Kampf. We next to Tony C, where Goring had his castles and everything. He was a great lover of horse flesh. And so he, uh, we loaded up all his horses after we killed the crowds out and took them along with us. And our next objective was purchase for Hitler's big eagle snakes. We took it, he had warehouses there to cover a city square block full of good whiskey and cognac and wine and champagne and everything else. So we loaded up a two and a half ton truck load of it and took it with us. We had a big 4th of July celebration. The war ended May the 8th. And when we did get back, 
we had a big fourth and two line celebration. We had horse races, rodeos, baseball games, and ten of us jumped with the new chute they'd come out with to see how it worked. They dropped us out and a bit of Z and Z. And they worked fine, but all of us made it. We all, uh, we, that is just a general history of airborne operations in Europe. We lost 70% on three different missions, Normandy, Holland, and Bastogne. Now, if any of you have a question, raise your hand and you'll be recognized, and I'll try to answer. But let's do it on the KISS system, K-I-S-S. That means keep it simple, stupid. You're just talking to a book private. I stayed in the Army three years and five months and 26 days and seven hours and 15 minutes and three seconds. And I never made PFC. <laughs> Somewhat. Go ahead. Jake, could you tell the story about how you dealt with uh, snipers when you were dealing with a whole crowd of people there in France and there was a sniper in the crowd? How did you address that? If we got sniped from a crowd, we killed the crowd. We did, then you had the sniper. The France had been occupied for four years, and a lot of those young ladies had married German soldiers and bore children by them, and their alliance was with the Germans, not the Americans that invaded. So if we got fire out of the crowd and couldn't determine who was doing the fire, we just killed the crowd. Paratroopers do not take prisoners. Any other question? Uh, Private. Hey, uh, did you lose your jump bag whenever you jumped out? Did you have a leg bag and did you lose it? What? Did you have a leg bag and did you jump? Did you lose no, it? I jumped with an M1 Garand across my chest and belly under my reserve chute. You need to get it open and fire quick. They was firing at you from the time you left the door of that plane until you hit the ground. It just takes six and a half seconds after you exit that door to be on the ground and ready to fight. So what night did you jump them then? We just, we would approach, we would approach our drop zone to 400 feet because the Germans didn't have radar that we detect anything lower than 400. And then when you got to the place that you wanted to jump, you'd all be hooked up and ready to go out the door and there'd be a red light on. And when it turned the green light on, they would raise the tail of the ship just a little where you'd blow under, and you'd go out of there at 300 to 350 feet. That's a 10-man football field, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Sam. I just got to say, um, I work for the Department of Veteran Affairs in Omaha, and I just want to say thank you for your service and what you've done. That's it's right. always an honor to talk to you guys and, and ask questions. Well, listen, thank you. You're probably still paying on taxes on what we tore up over there. <laughs> I, I, would just, I would just let you know that the, the McNeese's will be here for the rest of this club until about 4 o'clock. We're going to be taking them down at the invitation of Sir Ray and the British Command. Have them down as their honored guests for the British high tea. They'll, they'll return tomorrow sometime later in the, in the morning and then they'll be available through most of the day. And we would hope that they'll be able to stay with us if the weather cooperates. And Jake will be one of the marshals in our parade. And we'll, we'll then have him up on the stage and so forth for everybody who else is here who's not able to come here and listen to him today. They, they have brought their books with them. Mr. McNeese has written a book, which I think Eric's already mentioned to you, The Filthy 13. And Martha will take notes of however you would like to have the book dedicated if you wish to purchase a copy. Jake will dedicate it. And if you mention to us well, if, if one of your you family members or yourself was a member of the military, you'd be happy to make a special thank you note in the book to your relative and yourself for your services to the country. You were you all probably are curious how we got the name Filthy Thirteen. We were a group of Rebel soldiers. We just went in to fight a war and get it over with. We didn't polish shoes. We didn't pick up cigarettes, but, but we didn't sweep our barracks. We did We just shaved when we got ready to go to town, and we didn't ask for passes. We just took off when we got ready and came back when we ran out of money and women. And 
So they told us to fill the 13. They, if any sergeant got soldiers that he was having trouble with and couldn't handle, they would put him over in my unit. They had one unit to call the, the Warsaw 7. There were seven pull-offs. And they was having a tough time with them, so they put me in charge of that seven pull-off and five other troublemakers, and they called us the filthy 13. We didn't salute, we smoked on our head parades, we did anything we wanted to. Any questions? Yes. On the picture over here, where are you? On the picture right here? Yeah. The filthy 13 picture of the airplane? Which one of the gentlemen is you? Oh. Right here. Second one. That's out of six point. Right here. Mr. Jake. Mr. Jake right here with the light ring. Oh. Okay. I might note that this was a, uh, this is actually a limited print that was made from a painting that was unveiled uh, on the 4th at the uh, Mid-Atlantic uh, Museum's uh, big World War II event that they have each year out in Reading, Pennsylvania last weekend. And not only was Jake there, but Jack Agnew and two other, the other two survivors of the group that's still alive uh, we're all present for the unveiling of the painting. Uh, we will have copies of these prints available if people wish to purchase them. The people who are responsible for this have offered them to us here at the event at a discounted price. If anybody's interested, they can see me and I'll be more than happy to, uh, to explain to you the details of that. There will be an accompanying letter of authenticity, which I do not have right now, but they would be forwarded to any of the people who might purchase the, the painting or the prints, I'm saying. This is a 51 of 300, so I have 51 through number 100 of the prints right now available today. When I made my last jump and passed some, uh, after I had some down to prove Germany, they gave me a truck to get back to Luxembourg where I could get a plane back to England. And they all, uh, we went through a little town named St. Vith, Germany. It was just northwest of northeast of Bastogne, right on the border of the sea three times. And when Patton was approaching there, they told, told him, said, we have a very high sentimental value the national for the city of Bastogne. And I said, yeah, the city of St. Vin, and said, if you will, please don't attack it, just bypass it and it'll be on the fence. But when his first troops got in there, they ambushed about 20 tanks of his and killed all the supporting units that were traveling with them. So he called the Air Force and he said, I want this city blanket bombed. And as I came out and drove through it, there was not a wall left standing over one foot high. The bomb craters overlapped one or the east and west and north and south. And when they rebuilt the town after it was over, they built a podium in the center of the square and they had a statue of Jesus Christ standing on this podium with his hand raised toward his heart and across the face of it says thou shalt not lie. <laughs> Jake, I had the pleasure of meeting you last year and I got a copy of your book and it was fascinating. I inhaled that book and I I laughed and I cried and I loved it. Could you tell the story of when you stole a train? Yeah. <laughs> Could you tell that story? I was in town and I had missed all the trucks that were going back out to meet the time schedule. And I went in a cafe down to the railroad yard and an engineer and a farmer came in and sat down to eat and they just parked the locomotive right outside the restaurant. So I got out of there and got to look things over. And I lined up all the switches from there to the main line and jumped in that thing and fired her up and took off. They had, they had every railroad dick in Carolina and Georgia running in from every direction trying to find who had sold the train. But I got it back out and got it parked safely in the siding and set out flares on both sides of four pages. I used it safely and they all. Uh, they tried to pin it on me, but I never would confess it. Every time anything bad happened, they wanted to put it on McNeese. And they, 
we were sent to Sir Ernest Wells Manor House out there outside of Little Coat. And they, uh, he, he had a game reserve. He had about 150 Saika and Fallow deer. They're small, you know, about like a greyhound. And they were starving us to death in the mess hall. They'd feed you carrots and Brussels sprouts for breakfast, and you get the same thing reversed that evening for <laughs> dinner. So I didn't think that was quite right, and I'd go out every night and I'd shoot one or two of those deer and feed them to my men and my camp. And we never went to the mess hall. And they finally called them. the Bobbies out and everybody else and was interviewing everybody trying to find out. I'd hang these deer in a hollow tree to cool out every night when I'd come in and dress. And these Bobbies were talking to me and questioning me and interviewing me. And I'm leaning with my hand up against this hall of tree, and I've got two deer hanging up in there. <laughs> <laughs> but I fed my hand well. Yes, in the back. Yeah. 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 Uh, what about catching fish out there, too? Were you catching the fish? Oh, yeah. Right. They, had, they had a little river Kennet that ran through the estate there. And I had stolen two big aluminum forks out of the mess hall and made gigs out of them. And I just got, had the river clean, and he had diverted it and made two hatcheries down there. One for trout, one for jack salmon. So I went to work on them. And we'd, we'd eat fish while the deer were cooling, and, and rabbits and stuff like that. He came out and he found out. He saw all this trash down the dump, you know, these deer heads and everything. And so he ran a survey and he said that the Army owed him $10,000. Well, the officers were trying to get one of us to admit it where they could get the money off of us or they were going to have to come up with it. And Captain Daniels came up to me and he said, I'll tell you one thing, Mike Nation. He said, This is going to stop immediately. And I said, Well, you cut me to the quick indicating that you think I might be involved in that. <laughs> he said, Mike, he, he, he said, they could put me in a truck and blindfold me and run me in a circle around here for two hours and let me out. He said, I'm going to spread to your cab. How could you do that? He said, it smells like a hamburger and a barbecue sauce. <laughs> he said, you haven't been in a mess all in three months. <laughs> hey. I was always a sergeant in combat over anywhere from, from groups of 30 to 45 men on up to a company. I was the ranking sergeant. And when I would come back out of combat, within a week's time, they would bust me back to Buck Private, my niece. I never did make PFC. And last year we were down at a big museum in, in Georgia, and they were unveiling a bronze bust of me. And I uh, had a little ceremony there. And Martha laughed and she said, Well, they find a way to permanently bust you. Put out orders to the Air Force over there 
at any time they had accomplished their mission, if they had bombs left, that they would select an alternative to this and go ahead and bomb it and not try to come back and land on the airplane to fly bombs on. So they divided up, two of them took the Germans and two of them took us, as they call that friendly fire. It wasn't very friendly if he was down on the receiving end of it. But after we had taken it, the 502 Regiment took the city of Carrington and just held it for a day and got rooted out. The 501st tried to take it, and they couldn't handle it. They, did, they never entered it at all. So they turned it over to the 506, and there were about 900 of us left. This was on June the 12th. And they decided that the Germans hated that cold steel. They didn't like the bayonets at all. They decided we'd make a frontal bayonet assault on the city of Carrington at 6 o'clock in the morning. So we made the attack on at 6 o'clock in the morning with bayonets, frontal assault, and we rooted them out of there and took the city and held it. So then up in there and surrendered it again. Yes, let me continue. Is there was there is there one time that really stood out the most that you prayed? I, that is there one time that that stood out that you had that you prayed that to get me out of whatever circumstance that you were in over there? What one time would that have been? I imagine it was right there at, at Normandy on D Day. I got hit with shrapnel along the left side of my face and it completely blinded. I couldn't see, and there I was in the middle of 5,000 Germans wanting to kill me, and I'm blind. So I prayed to the Lord very seriously to get me through that, and I would be faithful to him from then on. Of course, when I did get out of it, everybody, I didn't live up to my end of the bargain. Tell me about after you took care of them, the characters were being sniped, that story. After we took Carrington for two or three days, there were paratroopers that were being sniped in the street. And every time you found one of them, you could see the steeple of this big cathedral. So they determined that's where the fire is coming from, the snipers. And they asked me to take two men into this cathedral and clean out the steeple. And I took two men with me, and we started in, and this Catholic priest held up his hand, he came out, he said, you can't come in here. According to the Geneva Convention, you cannot violate the sanctuary of worship of the, and sanctions and, and combat. And I said, well, you got a sniper up there in that seat, I said, we're going to win again. He said, no, you can't come in. And I just turned around and put my gun in his belly. And I said, would you like to be the first sacrifice? <laughs> <laughs> He said, no, he would and So we went on in, and there were two French men and one French woman that was up in that steeple doing the sniping. We killed them, of course, and threw them out. But you see many instances of that. And I met a young woman, I say a young woman. She was 71 years old, and she was just a little 11-year-old girl the morning we attacked her with bayonets. And she stood right in her front window and watched it all. And she saw me in uniform over there two years ago. And she came up and we embraced one another and kissed cheek and mercy the coup, you know, and all that. And she was crying profusely. I, I was trying to apologize and, and didn't have that command of the language, but there was a young Frenchman with her. And I asked him, I said, Do you speak English these kids? I said, well, you tell her that I'm sorry, but that was something that was necessary. And he said, oh, so she isn't upset about it. Said she had waited for 60 years to thank some paratrooper who gave them their liberty and their freedom. And she just wants to thank them. I met a young boy when I was in Baston. When we were in there, I had the opportunity to kill a little old boy about 14 years old. I didn't kill him. I should have, militarily, it would have been a smart thing to do, but I just didn't want to kill a little kid. And I kept him for six days under guard, fed him and this and that, 
I went back over and passed on two years ago. I met him. He's 74 years old now, and he's president of the biggest bank in Baston. So there were some good things that came out of the war. Yes, sir. Did you get to sell him a book? Did you sell him a book? No. <laughs> Got to go back. <laughs> I should have written him a hot check. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can you tell us how you met your wife? She wants to know how you, how you met your lovely wife. We well, don't remember me. I don't remember me. My first husband and his first wife died within a week. week. My first husband and his first, his first wife died within a week of each other before we knew each other. I had a baby boy and moved to Thompson City, Oklahoma, where my brother lived. Brought my mother with Keith Allen, and that was where she would be happy, and I could find some kind of job there. And my sister-in-law and his sister were basically in the story. And oh. we don't remember meeting. We went to church in the same place, but at a party the next spring, we were the only two Play singles. Them. The only two singles at that party, and we made partners first round of the game, and I had come with another couple, and they had a call that their child was sick. And he said, when he's marching with you and they get to us in the ground, he said, uh, we've got to go. Uh, Byron said. And Jay said, well, we've got two more hands to play. He said, y'all go on, I'll take them home. So he took them me home. And he went, took them to the door. And when I locked the door, Alan, Alan, my son, was about eight months old. And then he was three months old when his daddy died. I mean, three weeks old when his daddy died. But Alan was in Freedom of Bloody Murder, and Mother was snoring until the after the third of the the street. And Jay didn't say a word. She walked right straight in that house. And my sister, to Alan's crib, I'd be there in that house two dozen times. And stayed with him until she was running the high table. She got three of the And she danced him off to sleep. But how much is that dog in the window? But she was real talking to him at that time. And I said, if the secret is up in the morning, I'm going to take the job to the top and take it every morning. All the hours of how many years? He did you say come September? What did you eat in Normandy? Yes, there is more question. What did you eat in Normandy? How much you ate in Normandy? How much you ate in Normandy? In Normandy, when we jumped into Normandy, when you bail out of the door of that airplane, they give you one day's food right. That's it. From then on, you live what you can find. It was apple season over there at that time, and there was orchards all over Normandy. But uh, you would go from tree to tree to find one that tasted different. You find it up where you do whatever trees tasted like. But, but, we were without food and water for five days at night, my group was. And when we got out, we went back up to the edge of town there, and some French people cooked up a big pot of soup. They were dead cattle laying all over Normandy from Mom and, and chilling and so forth. And so they had cooked up a pot of soup there, and it was delightful. And, uh, a little shorty Milan came up to me when I reported in and he said, how would you like to sleep? And I said, fine. Well, he was firm St. George. Pretty soon he came back and said, that cover of platter. And I ate it, drank a bunch of whiskey, laid down with sleep. And when I woke up the next morning, Shorty was tapping me in the chest with another bottle of whiskey. And said, you want another steak? And I said, you bet. And he came back and he had it down under his field jacket. And he's kind of looking around at the approach. And I said, Shorty, you're going to have to be careful. I said, stealing that much steak off the general the colonel, he's going to miss it. And I had a salty goose and made a golden egg. He said, oh, I'm not getting any from the colonel. He said, you're getting it off of that big cow down there. <laughs> I said, why are you sneaking around? He said, the medics have put out an order that you can't eat these dead animals anymore. Any other questions?
I've got one story I'd like to tell you to put you in a little better mood. As a school teacher noticed that all everybody in the class is watching this one little boy in the sermon in the class. So she went back to check and see what the deal was, and he was scratching his groin and his right his part. And so she asked him what the deal was, and he said, I was circumcised. Yesterday and said, I'm irritable. And she said, you go down to the office and talk to your mother and see what she said. So he went down and talked to his mother and came back and sat down. She noticed everybody still watching him. And she goes back and looked at him. He had all of his private parts laid out in his lap there. And she said, well, I told you to go down and talk to your mother. And she tell you what to do. He said, I did. She said, what did she tell you to do? He said, she told me to tell her, just let her all hang out the loom she picked me up. <laughs> Any further questions? Thank all of you so very much. Thank you, Jerry.